The devil has been hunted down, captured and exhibited. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. America overcame Saddam Hussein. The tyrant is dethroned. Iraq celebrates and the world is freed from evil. That is the legend. But 40 years of relations between Saddam Hussein and the United States tell a whole other story. They were strange bedfellows. But they were bedfellows, there was a marriage of convenience. They exaggerated, they lied, they made believe. It is the story of a man and a superpower who used one another. He was regarded as a more dependable, reliable uh, Arab tyrant with whom we could deal. We would have preferred somebody who wasn't so crazy, but you, you, you work with what you have. A story of intertwining ambitions, shared cynicism, and mutual mistrust. Was it a faultless uh, uh, friendship where we said anything goes? No. From his first steps towards power to his final fall, Saddam Hussein saw nine American presidents come and go. I, George Walker Bush, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute... America sought to be the uncontested guardian of the Middle East. The Saddam saw himself as master of the Arabs. I, William Jefferson Clinton, do solemnly swear... But they had more in common than a mere hunger for power. I, George Herbert Walker Bush, do solemnly swear... As far back as this story goes, Saddam and the United States were a necessary evil for each other. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help to God. So help me God. This is the story of a tragic misalliance. When Saddam Hussein had this film made, he wanted to immortalize his first exploits. In 1959, he was 20 years old and attempted to assassinate the Iraqi president, General Qassem. He was a member of the Ba'ath Party, a clandestine socialist Arab resurrection movement. The attempt failed, and wounded in the leg, Saddam sought refuge in Damascus and Cairo. I uh, used to be in Cairo doing my uh, studies in law, and we were told that a group of Iraqis, about 10, are arriving that day from Damascus. Yes, that was the first time when we met. Mr. Saddam Hussein stayed with me for about three or four nights, and then he left into a villa which he stayed with some of his uh, friends. He was an ordinary member of the uh, Ba'ath uh, party. He was not in a leading position, uh, but uh, I liked him at that uh, period because he was calm. Uh, he didn't speak too much. Saddam Hussein and uh, the... Uh, was one or two of a small gangsters whom the founder of the Ba'ath Party despised. But some officers looked uh, on him as someone who can actually get rid of the enemies doing the dirty work. And when we talked to together, I noticed that he was honest. And politically speaking, he was clever and determined. But on the intellectual level, one cannot consider him as a profound uh, thinker at that period. And it was during this period of exile in Cairo uh, in the early 1960s uh, that he, like a number of other uh, of his colleagues in the Ba'ath, uh, became uh, a, 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 an informal operative for the CIA. And there is a clear record that young Saddam did pay the American embassy in Cairo, a number of visits during this period. 
Saddam's links with the Americans in Egypt are shrouded in mystery. But it is certain that their interests converged. The communists were common enemies. The Cold War was raging, and the Middle East at that time was one of the fronts. Far from Cairo, Baghdad was in a state of siege. It was the 8th of February, 1963. On 8.30, actually, my mother told me, at that time I was uh, having my bath, uh, uh, I was in the bathroom, okay, and my mother told me, well, there is a coup, there is a coup. General Qasem was targeted once more. Immensely popular for having freed Iraq of the monarchy and of British influence, he had sided with the communists. Against him were nationalist officers and Ba'ath militants. Four years after their failed attempt, Saddam Hussein's comrades in arms tried their luck once more. Early morning of the revolution against Qasem, there was many, many things, many places we should control it. For example, the uh, bridges in Baghdad, the uh, oil station, the radio stations, and the fighting continued for uh, three days. We communists and many other people were, were expecting that something might happen. And we thought that we can face it, we can oppose it. They were wrong, and the putsch succeeded. Qasem was captured and transferred to the television studios. And the entrance to the studio, أحد الواقفين بالخارج ضربه على رأسه الموجودين معظمهم قالوا يجب أن يعدم الآن لأن الشيوعيين الآن في مناطق عدة من بغداد يقاومون فإذا بقى على قيد الحياة ستستمر المقاومة الشيوعية ولكن إذا أعدم الآن وأعلن إعدامه Qasem and his companions were executed and paraded on national television. Well, I was at home. I was looking at television. There was one broadcasting station in television. We had this on. We had the radio on. We wanted to get all the news. And, and when they, they had the picture of Qasem being dead, being killed, uh, this was very important for them. It was repeated over and over again. The Ba'athists were delighted, as were Washington and the CIA. As an ally of Moscow, Qasem had been on their hit list. A friend of mine, he was working in the American embassy, said that the American amb ambassador was so tense, so when he was walking all around the embassy, and when he, and he was opening uh, the radio, and when he heard about the coup, he opened a champagne bottle and asked the, all the staff to celebrate the, their, uh, the, the coup. Personally, I considered it a, a real triumph for the CIA. They didn't have very many of them, and there were a lot of coup attempts that had gone sour, but this one worked, and it was for a good cause. I think it was a very good thing that happened. There was a major CIA involvement in the 1963 coup, and arms were flown clandestinely from Turkey. Uh, a, a lot of money, a lot of financial support. CIA planning was involved in the early stages of the coup. Now, the bath was extremely eager, of course, to, uh, to take power, uh, but they did need the American help. With the elimination of Qasem, it was open season on communists. The CIA has been accused of supplying lists of the activists to eradicate. The American authorities have always denied this. The fact that there'd been an enormously bloody uh, put-down of the communists in Baghdad was surely welcome news in Washington. The, the concerns we had that went on for decades about Soviet intentions uh, should never be minimized. For Saddam Hussein, the road was now clear, and he returned to Iraq from Cairo. The boy from a poor family in a rural backwater now joined in the coup d'etat. 
At the age of 24, he organized the Ba'ath Party's security services and began his rise to power. After he got back to Baghdad, Saddam officially became uh, an interrogator and uh, a torturer. He was feared. He showed no mercy whatsoever. And uh, this became part of the character of Saddam. This became part of his claim to fame. He's a tough guy. He was so busy with his uncle and with, 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 with other gangsters forming the, uh, the military, the, 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 the hardcore, the execution squad. Violent and uncontrollable, the Ba'athists were sidelined by the military after just 10 months. General Aref resumed power for himself, and Saddam and his comrades went underground once more. In 1964, I met Saddam, and, and that was first time. He called himself Muhammad. Salah Omar Ali, who today lives on the outskirts of Baghdad, is one of Saddam's oldest companions. Because he is using a dialogue of my area, I thought he is Saddam. And I asked him, uh, are you sure? Uh, 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 is your name really Muhammad? He smiled. I said, are you Saddam? He said, yes, I am Saddam. The man who called himself Muhammad entrusted Salah with his first mission. Apparently quite innocuous, he had to steal a printing press. For Saddam, life in hiding came to an end when he was arrested by General Aref's police. He and his companion spent 20 months behind bars. Sobi Abdel Hamid is one of the officers who removed Saddam and the Ba'athists from power. Ironically, he was also behind an historic decision which would lead to their return a few years later. When Saddam was in prison, Sobi was appointed foreign minister. This is I, and this is President Arif. In the midst of the Cold War, Aref was tempted to move closer to Moscow. His chance came on May 14, 1964. A ceremony was held in Egypt to mark the beginning of work on the Aswan Dam, financed by the USSR. President Nasser organized an official cruise and invited Soviet Supremo Khrushchev and President Arif. On board, Sobi organized the first meeting with the Soviets. <laughs> هنا شعر الأمريكان بأنهم سيخسرون العراق نهائيا ففضلنا الاتحاد السوفيتي على الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية Saddam Hussein would take advantage of this situation. The United States could not allow Iraq to become another Soviet satellite. The elimination of the RF regime would become the common objective for both the young Ba'athist and the CIA. The CIA's contacts inside uh, Baghdad and Iraq were principally these Ba'ath politicians and political figures like Saddam Hussein. But other communications were conducted especially by the Iraqi ambassador to Lebanon then. His name was Al Hani. July 17th, 1968. The streets of Baghdad were the stage for another Ba'athist coup d'etat. The decisive event that would propel Saddam Hussein to power. And I was there. In the midnight, we go to the uh, palace and we did use a military uh, cloth and uh, we have the, our weapons and we surrounded the palace. Uh, Saddam was with us and uh, Mr. Uh, Baker, uh, I mean, our president, first president, took the telephone and talking to Arif, asking him to surrender and to came to the headquarters and he gave him uh, I think five minutes. President Aref surrendered and this time not a single shot was fired. The Ba'athists seized power supported by the United States. 
Saddam was still not 30, but emerged from the party rank and file to become the new regime's number two. In about a year and a half, by the time he became vice president, he had about seven or eight of the major departments of the country under his command. We knew, of course, from 68 on, that he was the power behind the throne. But we didn't attach any particular uh, significance to him, except that he was a very ruthless customer, very tough. But as I say, the, the reputation of the whole, the, the, the reputation was that you couldn't rule Iraq any other way. In January 1969, one episode clearly indicated the new regime's brutality. Trials for treason opened in Baghdad. Saddam's men arrested, tortured, and forced confessions from various suspects, many of whom were Jews. They were hung in public, and the Iraqis were invited to witness their suffering. The world protested, but did nothing. And suddenly the United States of America would be standing there and the adopted or created child, the bad government that put in power, has all of a sudden become an embarrassing relationship. The United States were dealing with a two-faced regime. The Bakr Saddam duo skillfully exploited the rivalry between East and West without ever siding with one camp or the other. As a repression of communists continued in Baghdad, Saddam accompanied Bakr to Moscow to sign a treaty of friendship with the USSR. The same year, to the great joy of the Iraqis, he nationalized oil. And as he denounced American imperialism, Saddam increasingly opened up the country to Western influences. There is a time through the early 70s when Saddam is a very visible presence of the kind of modernization and westernization that many Iraqis were hoping for. He wore Western suits, he talked about education, modernization, bringing in the West. Saddam's basic plan when he assumed power in Iraq uh, could not be faulted. Saddam wanted to drag Iraq into the 20th century, probably by its hair, screaming. The difference between him and other people was in the fact that Saddam was willing to sacrifice half of the population of Iraq to do that, and the others weren't. Terror and benevolence. Saddam Hussein willingly exploited both facets of his image. Surrounded by his bodyguards, he created set pieces for the complacent eye of official cameras. Adel Darwish was at this time a young British journalist. He was covering a cultural festival in Baghdad and met the man known as Mr. Deputy. One of the films actually were shown in the festival was Godfather Part One, the film about the mafia. And I think the large part of the topic of conversation uh, was about the film, uh, Godfather Part One, and Saddam's own explanation and own interpretation of the events of this film. And that didn't really make sense to me until almost 20, 25 years later, uh, looking through his events and the way he dealt with political events, with his political opponents, and indeed with his own family. Faced with a character who was equally tyrannical and pragmatic, Washington was at a loss as to what to do. At least superficially, it looks like we uh, we uh, floated back, back and forth. Iraq did not fall under the two identifications they understand. It wasn't a friend. Iraq was not a friend. There was no trust. And it wasn't an enemy. It wasn't a foe. But then 
the unexpected happened. January 1979, the Shah of Iran was deposed. He was Washington's staunchest ally in the Gulf. Ayatollah Khomeini, who took power, was a Shiite fundamentalist, and his preaching rallied the poor and oppressed. وقف نظام صدام حسين مذعورا جدا من هذه الحركة لأنه توقع أن تنتقل فورا إلى العراق وهذا صحيح هي كانت مرشحة للانتقال السريع إلى العراق. America too was afraid for oil and for Israel. The Tehran revolutionaries targeted American interests. Khomeini had succeeded in bringing Saddam and Washington together. The implacability of the hatred that the Ayatollah expressed towards Western interests and particularly towards the United States. We were not hearing that from Saddam. And on the contrary, what we were hearing was a universal Arab world voice saying, uh, support this leader. Now, Saddam had a history of brutalizing the Shia, killing the Shia, assassinating the Shia, who are majority in Iraq. He actually showed his true color. He showed his brutality to the Americans. The Americans said, this is our man. This is our man that we can actually use. He would be absolutely and totally ruthless. He was definitely viewed as a lesser evil. Confronted by the Islamic threat, Saddam Hussein consolidated his grip over the regime. On July 17, 1979, he dismissed Bakr, forcing him to announce his resignation for health reasons. Five days later, he waged brutal and spectacular purges against 19 supposed conspirators within the Ba'ath Party. Saddam was seized by paranoia. And gloweringly, gruesomely, as he identified them by name, plain clothesmen would show up in the hallway and escort that man out of the hallway and we have never seen any of the 19 again. It was the Iraqi night of the long knives. At the age of 40, Saddam had achieved his objective. He was sole master of Iraq. But he didn't stop there. He wanted to be the uncontested leader of the Arabs. A war against Iran, weakened by its revolution, would enable him to satisfy his ambition. Nobody would be able to stop him. For Salah, the days in hiding with Saddam were long gone. In 1979, he was the Iraqi ambassador at the United Nations. When he accompanied Saddam to Cuba for a conference, Salah still believed that conflict could be avoided. He organized a last chance meeting between Saddam and the Iranian foreign minister. When the meeting finished, Saddam asked me about my own impression. I said, Mr. President, the war is not a joke. We will lose everything, and there is no any guarantee we will win the war. The situation now, the problem, under your hand. And then he didn't say anything. He kept silent about two or three minutes, and then he started talking to me. He said, look, Salah. Prepare yourself in the United Nations. We will resume the war. Saddam attacked on September 22, 1980. He naturally claimed that he was not at war with Iran to serve American interests. Washington, too, has always denied having pushed Saddam into war with Iran. But for the USA, the former enemy of communism was now their best defense against the Islamic Revolution. The time for overt cooperation between Saddam and the Americans had come. I received a message through the Iraqi ambassador to Washington that well, there was an interest as early as 1983 in establishing full diplomatic relations. There's a bunch of visits that go on and contacts. There's a 
uh, the now famous meeting where Secretary Rumsfeld uh, goes to uh, Baghdad and literally says, this is a guy I could work with. And we begin the offers uh, of, of assistance, of cooperation. Uh, certainly they get loans to buy food, but the Iraqis are never easy to deal with. Richard Murphy took part in the meeting. His memory of his contact with Saddam Hussein is an ironic souvenir. One of the quotes uh, I can pull back from my own memory of that was Saddam making a joke which uh, went along this line that uh, America's attitude towards the third world is like the attitude of an Iraqi peasant when he takes a new bride. Uh, three days of tea and honey and then off to the fields to work like a serf for the rest of their life. Richard Murphy merely smiled. At that time, America was supplying Iraq with satellite pictures, military information and loans. The Reagan administration even allowed Saddam to purchase the ingredients for weapons of mass destruction in the US. The blueprints uh, of chemical factories were actually supplied uh, by uh, a, a, a sort of subcontractors from American companies uh, to help the uh, Iraqis build their own chemical weapons. Now, chemical weapons are quite interesting, really, because uh, the law stops you supplying the chemical weapons, but you can get away with it by supplying the actual plans. And this, unbelievably, is the blueprint for a whole chemical warfare plant that was provided to the Iraqis by an American company with the knowledge and approval of the United States. This is cynicism of the highest order. The war had already claimed hundreds of thousands of victims and now threatened the flow of oil in the Gulf. The American Navy was on general alert. In 1987, one tragic event confirmed that Ronald Reagan was prepared to forgive Saddam Hussein almost everything. We have the USS Stark, the leading uh, ship uh, in the Persian Gulf, being hauled by an exercise missile fired by an American, by an uh, Iraqi pilot. And it killed 37 of the crewmen. Uh, and the Iraqis immediately apologized. They said it was a mistake. And they indemnified the, uh, the families of the dead people. Uh, and the whole thing was brushed over. In a good normal day, that would be cause not for protest, not for being upset, not for agitating. That's almost cause for war. Yet, immediately after that happened, the administration in Washington went into the business of saying, it's an accident, and accidents happen in war. This event underlines once more the seriousness of the tensions that exist in the Middle East and the importance of trying to do something about them. The United States indulgence was even more flagrant when the Halabja affair was revealed. The Iranians flew representatives of the world's press across the now silent battlefield. In this Kurdish village, the Iranians claimed that Saddam Hussein's army gassed 5,000 civilians. I was chairman of the Chemical Weapons Convention when Iran came with pictures and showed, and showed the destruction of the chemical weapons used uh, and the Halabja. And very little was made of that outside uh, what, outside of Kurdistan, outside of Iraq? Certainly you didn't see much of it in the American or the European press. The Soviet Union was silent, France, US, everyone was just keep quiet. And I am the only delegate, Sweden. And I know they were nervous in Stockholm also. I said this is unacceptable and must be condemned. Dead silence. Not one in this whole, with that time, 35 states con conference and disarmament, all major weapons countries involved in China also, of course. No one lifted a finger. Saddam's absolution can appear to have been total. 
and yet he constantly had doubts about America's real intentions. Saeed Burish was at this time a respected advisor to Saddam Hussein. The Iraqi president confided in him that the US was far from being a reliable ally. Saddam Hussein made it very plain to me that if the United States wanted the war to stop, they would stop it. But that they wanted it to continue. He was obviously taken aback, more than taken aback, hugely disappointed in the fact that the world is sitting on the sidelines watching the shedding of blood between those two countries. A secret American arms sale to Iran had convinced Saddam of Washington's duplicity. The affair caused a scandal in the US. And President Reagan had to send his Assistant Secretary of State, Richard Murphy, to appease Saddam Hussein. One difficulty Mr. Murphy had to explain away was why the United States had supplied arms secretly to Hussein's enemies. Mr. Murphy said there would be no repetition of that limited exception. And to back up his words, he gave the Iraqi leader a letter from President Reagan. It's curious, but there never was a clear, strong, angry protest from Baghdad. And the best interpretation I could ever give that reaction was the one of cynicism. This is, this is what great nations do. They don't uh, necessarily keep to their word or their stated policy. On August 20th, 1988, the cannons at last stopped firing. After eight years of conflict, Iraq was declared the winner. The war claimed millions of victims, both dead and wounded. Cities were razed, and refugees fled in their thousands. Saddam celebrated with a suitably extravagant victory parade. When George Bush came to power in 1989, the map of the world had changed. Islamic threats had been eradicated in the Gulf, communism was collapsing in the Soviet Union, and George Bush no longer had any need for Saddam Hussein. The conditions that brought us into this area to begin with and kept us there, kept us there as, uh, as a supporter and covert uh, ally of Saddam Hussein, are disappearing right in front of our eyes and disappearing very rapidly. So while observers wouldn't have seen any basic shift in American foreign policy, there were elements, and notably in the command of the Central Command, that uh, were entertaining the potential of a new danger from Iraq. There had been a major annual military exercise. The commander was Norman Schwarzkopf, and he changed the basic scenario of a threat to American interests by saying uh, there's no longer a serious threat from the Soviet Union. And he introduced the scenario of an Iraqi attack on Kuwait. Armed to the teeth, Saddam Hussein had become a threat and a menace with certain needs. After eight years of war, the Iraqi economy was in ruins and his Arab neighbors did nothing to help him. On the contrary. Suddenly, out of nowhere, Kuwait begins to overproduce oil to such an extent that the oil price begins to come down. And they were uh, pouring their own oil onto the market. And every time the price of oil dropped by one dollar, Iraq lost a billion dollars worth of income. Saddam Hussein summoned the American ambassador. Saddam had that famous interview with April Glaspie. He laid it all out. He said, I can't, I can't go on like this. I, I have to have money. I, I have to renegotiate my debts. You've got to get the Kuwaitis to uh, stop playing with the oil. The two sides were talking, but who was kidding who? Saddam, who claimed he had no intention of invading Kuwait, or Glaspie, who said the United States would not get involved. And Ambassador Glaspie said something to the effect, well, uh, that that was your business as a border dispute. Um, 
we were not concerned. Uh, he told her that uh, he had no intention of using military action against Kuwait in this dispute, uh, so long as there was a negotiating process ongoing. But Saddam lied. Believing firmly in American neutrality, on August 2nd, 1990, he launched a blistering offensive against Kuwait. In the Iraqi National Assembly, Saddam was applauded for the invasion. But one question was immediately being asked. By invading Kuwait, was he not falling into an American trap? One part of the United States was in complete agreement with the Kuwaitis regarding undermining Saddam. We have undermined Khomeini. Now it is time to get this guy. So that I think that uh, this conspiracy-mindedness, uh, we wanted to trick Iraq into war so we could seize their oil and, and station our troops in the Persian Gulf forever. That's conspiracy thinking. And it's, it's cute, but it's, it's silly. Despite the official denials, Congress demanded to know more and asked Ambassador Glassby for explanations about her meeting with Saddam Hussein. She denied giving him any kind of go-ahead and indeed claimed to have put him on his guard. We foolishly did not realize that he was stupid, that he did not believe our clear and repeated warnings that we would support our vital interests. The controversy surrounding the trap theory remains unresolved. But whether it was an unforced error or not, Saddam believed he was in control. Four days after the invasion, the American charge d'affaires in Baghdad was summoned to see Saddam Hussein. Joseph Wilson is the last American diplomat to have met Saddam. On August the 8th, he encountered a man quite sure of himself. When I came to the, the room, uh, Saddam was standing in the middle of the room, staring at me, unblinking. Um, eye to eye, um, as I like to say, it was a who is going to blink first contest. Uh, the time came to shake hands and he put his hand out and um, I stared at him and just took his hand without looking down because I had learned, uh, having watched um, him for a couple of years, that there was a tendency on his part to try and set the stage in such a way that the image he would send out to his people after the meeting was one where uh, the visitor was bowing to him at the time that you took his hand. So I just stared at him and, and grabbed his hand. Saddam proposed a deal with America. The purpose of the meeting was to tell me that should the United States not react to uh, his uh, invasion of Kuwait, that he would uh, guarantee us a steady supply of petroleum at a cheap price and uh, he would also not invade Saudi Arabia. And my response to him in this meeting was, uh, was get out of Kuwait, quit looting American properties, and um, uh, allow all Americans to leave the region. Please raise their hand. Saddam had triggered a process he could not stop. Immediately after the invasion, the United Nations unanimously condemned the attack and voted for the use of force. America was determined to put an end to a man who had served their own interests for so long. Saddam was suddenly cast into the role of the devil. As was the case in the 1930s, we see in Saddam Hussein an aggressive dictator threatening his neighbors. The Iraqi president replied through threatening televised messages. Five months ago, Saddam Hussein started this cruel war against Kuwait. Tonight, the battle has been joined. Forty days of bombing and 100 hours of ground war laid waste to the Iraqi army. A vast coalition led by the U.S. expelled him from Kuwait. With his army crushed, and isolated on the international stage, Saddam Hussein was a pariah and humiliated. 
After 23 years of violent rule, his fall appeared inevitable. And yet an unwitnessed event would bolster his position. In the country's Shiite south, under American control, Iraqi soldiers rebelled with support from the local population. In 1991, I was responsible for dealing with the Shia Islamic groups in Iraq. Um, I knew them all. I talked to them. Uh, th their intention in 1991 was to remove the regime, set up some sort of Shia government in Iraq, at least in the south where most of the Shia live, and make it more or less what you could describe an Islamic republic. تسقط النظام وانتشرت في كل مكان وحتى المحافظات السنية الأربعة كانت مهيئة للانتفاضة بل وشاركت بعض من أعطقها. The insurrection was openly encouraged by President Bush. But there's another way for the bloodshed to stop, and that is for the Iraqi military and the Iraqi people to take matters into their own hands to force Saddam Hussein, the dictator, to step aside. I think the original the appeal Nations made by George Bush Sr. was nothing but hot air. And it is unfortunate for the people who took it seriously to have taken it seriously. On the ground, the American military did nothing to help the rebellion. Quite the opposite. Here, the Americans agreed to what they wanted to do with the أعطوهم السماح بطيران طائرات الهليكوبتر وسمحوا لها بالعبور عبر المناطق التي يستولي عليها الأمريكان. The American military admits to allowing the Iraqis to use their own helicopters, but only for civil purposes. Now General Schwarzkopf has admitted he made a mistake. The general says he now thinks the Iraqis always plan to use their helicopters to suppress revolt. I think I was suckered, Storman Norman says, and he regrets his decision to allow the Iraqis to use helicopters. Do I? think that the United States should bear guilt uh, because of suggesting that the Iraqi people take matters into their own hands, with the implication being given by some that the United States would be there to support them militarily. That was not true. It was now too late. The rebellion was crushed in a bloodbath. <laughs> The result of that was a minimum of 150,000 people dead. What would we have been able to do unless we had gone to total war, which nobody wanted to do, there was no support, Europe would have been appalled. Would France have supported any of this? I don't think so. They were too concerned about shoring up Saddam and protecting French interests, as was everybody else looking to protect their own interests. We were afraid of upsetting the balance in the Gulf between the, Shun the Shia and the Sunni. It, President Bush, the father at that time, uh, Colin Powell, uh, even Cheney said this is n exactly what we don't want to do. Chaos was always uh, a scenario to be considered. If Saddam were gone, what, could, what would follow? Rule by someone in his family, rule by another Sunni Ba'athist elitist, rule by a triumvirate, a coalition, chaos. <laughs> Once again, Saddam's brutality had served him well. With the risk of chaos, Washington saw him as the only alternative, an enforcer for Iraq. He created a massive personality cult while maintaining his regime of terror. He presented the image of a believer but eliminated the religious leaders who criticized him. At the head of a mafia-style system, he accumulated incalculable wealth as the Iraqi people lived in poverty. Saddam remained in power, but in reality his survival hung on internal battles within the American administration. At that point, those who were asking for his head had lost out. 
On several occasions, attempts were made to trigger a coup d'etat, but the operations were almost farcical. Robert Baer, who lives today in Colorado, took part in one of these missions. Between September 1994 and March 1995, we had a series of CIA teams. I was head of one of them to go in and, and actually see if we could do a coup d'etat. We, 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 when we went in, we walked across the border. We were under the protection of a Kurdish militia. Uh, we got in touch with military officers in February, actually in January 1995, who said, yes, we can do a coup d'etat. Uh, this plan was sent to Washington and ultimately was rejected on the 28th of February by the White House. And the CIA was only allowed to engage in quick fixes. They were never allowed to do the kind of sustained, serious approach to regime change that was required and which would have been allowed if Iraq truly was a threat to the United States. The CIA's presence in Iraq was purely symbolic to appease the hawks on the hill. Honor had to be paid uh, to, uh, to our official disdain for this man, uh, and I think uh, the order certainly did go out from the, uh, from the Clinton administration to do something. But how vigorously it was pursued, uh, how effectively, how enthusiastic the CIA would have been at that point about replacing him, uh, we, may, we may doubt. Clinton wanted to know specifically who would replace, which, what was the name of the military officer, what was his plan, what was his attitude toward Israel, um, who would be the commanders of these units, and a whole long list of questions which no one could ever answer, which was Clinton's way of saying, no, it's too messy. Saddam Hussein could take things easy. The White House had given up on eliminating him. Another strategy was in place, to keep Iraq under the international thumb. In 1990, the UN voted for a strict economic blockade. Officially, the embargo would remain in place until Saddam's arsenal had been entirely destroyed. UN inspectors forced the Iraqis to cooperate and soon became convinced that Iraq no longer posed a real threat. And yet the sanctions were maintained. Saddam was still under close surveillance. There's something comfortable about having him in the box of sanctions and a regime of international inspection uh, that he is in in, in the 1990s uh, that, we, uh, uh, that I think we come to accept. But it was the Iraqi people who paid the price for the sanctions. Children died from the lack of health care. Families became even poorer. <laughs> At the end of the 90s, the international community was concerned about the sanctions. The voices were raised at the UN to put a stop to them. Governments had not the stomach to, uh, to go up and say sanctions are good while children were shown on the TV. And uh, Saddam very ca ca manipulated it very, very cleverly. So we knew we were in a, in a losing battle, that, that sanctions were going to you know, erode to the point that eventually they, they become a joke. If you lift sanctions, you break containment. If you break containment, you no longer have Saddam Hussein under control. Sanctions and war are, are linked to each other. So if you go against sanctions, you should know. I, I have nothing against critical against sanctions. But if you do that, you should know there is only war left. For Washington, there was no question of letting Saddam out of his cage. Without containment, he would have to disappear. His elimination was programmed. The September 11 attacks made his execution possible. The war against terrorism could justify anything. Washington made up a case for the prosecution. War on terror is not confined strictly to the Al-Qaeda. The war on terror involves Saddam Hussein because of the nature of Saddam Hussein, the history of Saddam Hussein, and his willingness to terrorize himself. Saddam Hussein has terrorized his own people. 
He's terrorized his own neighborhood. He is a danger. He's a danger to the American people. And we got to deal with him. We got to deal with him before it's too late. The devil has been hunted down, captured, and exhibited. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. America overcame Saddam Hussein. The tyrant is dethroned. Iraq celebrates and the world is freed from evil. That is the legend. But 40 years of relations between Saddam Hussein and the United States tell a whole other story. They were strange bedfellows. But they were bedfellows, there was a marriage of convenience. They exaggerated, they lied, they made believe. It is the story of a man and a superpower who used one another. He was regarded as a more dependable, reliable, uh, Arab tyrant with whom we could deal. إنما بدرت أمور في الفترة الأخيرة كانت تدل بوضوح على أن التنسيق ما زال قائما. We would have preferred somebody who wasn't so crazy, but you 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 work with what you have. A story of intertwining ambitions, shared cynicism, and mutual mistrust. أمريكا كانت تستغل أخطاء صدام وتستفاد منها. Was it a faultless uh, uh, friendship where we said anything goes? No. From his first steps towards power to his final fall, Saddam Hussein saw nine American presidents come and go. I, George Walker Bush, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute... America sought to be the uncontested guardian of the Middle East. The Saddam saw himself as master of the Arabs. I, William Jefferson Clinton, do solemnly swear but they had more in common than a mere hunger for power. I, George Herbert Walker Bush, do solemnly swear. As far back as this story goes, Saddam and the United States were a necessary evil for each other. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help to God. So help me God. This is the story of a tragic misalliance. When Saddam Hussein had this film made, he wanted to immortalize his first exploits. In 1959, he was 20 years old.